I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Nicole Earhart, uh, who has graciously come on our Zoom um, Hollywood Squares uh, um, meeting today. And Nicole is the director of the Center for Healthy Aging and a full professor in clinical sciences at the College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences at Colorado State University. She holds the Ross M. Wilkins, MD, Limb Preservation Foundation University Chair in Musculoskeletal Biology and Oncology. She is the Director of the Laboratory of Comparative Musculoskeletal Oncology and Traumatology and has been actively involved in limb preservation research, regenerative medicine, tissue engineering, and sarcoma research for the last 18 years. She holds joint faculty positions in the School of Biomedical Engineering, the Cell and Molecular Biology Program, the Gates Regenerative Medicine Center at the University of Colorado, and the University of Colorado Cancer Center. In addition to her research, she has held several leadership positions in national and international organizations, such as the American College of Veterinary Surgeons, the Veterinary Society for Surgical Oncology, um, the Veterinary Orthopedic Society, and chair of the 2014 World Veterinary Orthopaedic, um, because it's British, um, Congress Committee. And she is the first woman to be granted a university level endowed chair position at Colorado State University. Well done, Nicole. Um, probably long overdue, right? Yeah. Um, and she is actively engaged in translational aging, bone, and muscle regeneration regeneration research to benefit um, both human and canine patients. And I thank Nicole so much. I've known Nicole. She's entering the 30-year club. She was, of course, a tiny child uh, when I first met her many years ago and a resident mate. And thank you so much, Nicole. I will applaud for everyone. Oh, thanks, Kelly. Oh, my gosh. What a great introduction. And uh, I am thrilled to be here. It looks like we have close to 38 people. Thank you guys for joining. My goodness, I know it's been challenging to get these kinds of things organized. So I am really honored to share with you a bunch of projects that we've been working on at CSU surrounding aging and musculoskeletal health and, and comparative medicine. So without further delay, I'm going to see if I can share my screen here and hopefully that will work. And then we'll get started. So can everybody See, Kelly, I can see you, so just nod if you can see the screen. Great. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do is just share with you a little bit about um, what's been happening in the field of comparative aging at Colorado State and around the world, really. Um, and I think what you'll find is that this is, is really interesting because um, when I first started um, studying how musculoskeletal disease, how musculoskeletal tissues, sorry, age, um, I became really um, interested in the whole process of how cells age. So I want to share with you a little bit about where we're at on this. And there's some stuff in here that sounds a little bit like science fiction, but is actually real and I think coming very soon to the human population. So of course, you know, since recorded history, we have been, as a, as a human population, fascinated with the idea of rejuvenating ourselves or, or regaining our youth. And this is a a very famous painting that was done in about 1500 in Germany depicting the artist's idea of what the fountain of youth would look like. And you can see the elderly people that are brought down to the fountain from the surrounding hillsides on the left, and then they're disrobed, and then they swim through the fountain of youth. And as they progress through the water, then they are rejuvenated and young again, and they emerge from the other side, um, and they are dressed in finery and participate in this wonderful feat feast and dancing, etc. And so this has been kind of the, the maybe the fascination or hope of all mankind since, since well, since we've ever even recorded history. But of course, despite the enthusiasm of the ancient people, um, you know, aging now and is known to be universal and inevitable. And modern medicine has taught us this, but even without the benefit of understanding how aging occurs, it's something that we observe. We observe it on a whole organism level, um, on an organ level, if we drill down beneath the skin, so this is the a, a brain of a younger person versus an aged person. On a tissue level, this is the muscle of a younger person versus an aged person. On a cellular level, and even down to the molecules within our DNA and the ability that we have now to understand uh, different methylation sites and how we can actually use DNA methylation as a biologic clock to understand how our cells age. 
But recently, myself and, and others have asked the question, is this actually true? This entrenched paradigm that aging is inevitable and irreversible and universal, is that really true? And I give you a couple of examples of why this has suddenly come into question. So let's just take these two individuals. Both of them are 80 years old, and clearly the man on the upper left is very fit for his age, um, an unusual level of fitness um, and health. And the man on the bottom right is maybe more typical of a person in their eighth decade of life, needs a little assistance to walk, maybe on some several medications and perhaps in a memory unit, unit or other type of assisted living situation. And the question becomes, what is different about these two individuals? Because chronologically, they have been on the earth for exactly the same amount of time. But from a biologic perspective, it really does look like they are very different. And what's interesting about people in their eighth decade of life and older is that they tend to fall into two different populations of people. You either see people that are kind of out on the golf course four days a week type of people living independently in their 80s, or there are people that are you know, more like the gentleman on the lower right. And interestingly enough, there does not seem to be a whole lot of people in between those two. So they're either really active, maybe not quite as fit as this upper left gentleman, but you know, very active and independent or really suffering from the burden of chronic age-related disease. So the question becomes, can we actually turn back the clock? And now we know that there are certainly lifestyle changes that are associated with delayed aging. For example, across all species that have ever been studied, a lifelong habit of exercise, good sleep, stress reduction, and interestingly, intermittent fasting or caloric restriction. All four of those things are lifestyle issues that we know promote longevity. And we can see this from flies and worms, through mammals, all the way to people. So these are things that we know do sort of slow aging, but these are also lifestyle changes that have to occur over a very long period of time in order to see an effect. We also know that the world is aging, right? I mean, by the year 2050, it's estimated that, you know, 25% of the entire globe's population will be over the age of 65. You can look at this on an individual nation basis. This happens to be demographics for Japan, which has one of the largest aged populations in the world. And so this, this concept that we are aging and that aging people will be greater and greater proportions of the whole population has really caused people to think, how are we going to address all of these age-related diseases that we see in this aging population? And so in the area, in the field of um, gerontology or healthy aging research, the concept really isn't so much to improve lifespan, but it is to improve health span. So we know, for example, in the United States that people are living longer now than they ever have before. The average lifespan in the U.S. is 79, which has increased since right around the uh, 1950s or so. But interestingly, the health span or the number of years that we are free of the burden of chronic disease has not changed over that time. And so while we may be living longer, what's happening is we're living longer with a greater burden of disease. And nobody really wants to be living until 120, for example, and feeling like they're 120. So then we began to think about, okay, well, what is the common element among all of these age-related diseases? You know, the things that we know about, cancer, stroke, arthritis, heart disease, frailty. And the one common element among all the diseases is aging itself. So what if instead of thinking about this in a whack-a-mole kind of way where we're let's cure cancer and let's cure cataracts or heart disease, we think about what is the common element in attacking that as the disease itself rather than sort of an age-independent uh, approach. And so the concept then is to take our, our health span and increase it. So the common paradigm or well-accepted paradigm is that we live at, uh, our normal lifespan, we're relatively healthy until we reach about our 70s, and then we begin this kind of slow decline and eventually um, we'll, we will pass away. The concept here is to move that curve to the right. So instead of increasing lifespan per se, what we're trying to do is increase the number of healthy years that we have, and then we don't have this long tail with this burden of, of chronic disease. And so instead of having a long tail, what we have is a very acute drop off right at the end of our life. So whatever the, the number of years that we live, the number of years that we live healthily 
is greater. So that's the concept of increasing health span. And this is just an illustration depicting the really the same thing is diminishing the number of years in our late life that we're in ill health and improving the healthy span of life. Now, this has certainly gotten the um, attention of a lot of people around the world because if you think about what this would do e economically in terms of saving on healthcare expenses as we get older, slowing aging by 20%, it's estimated would save $20 trillion in healthcare expenses over the next 30 years, and that's just in the United States. And that alone, just by slowing aging by 20%, would, increase, would save more money in healthcare than curing heart disease, curing cancer, and all of those different individual diseases um, cumulatively over time. So the idea is to die young as late as possible. So if you're gonna study aging, the first thing you have to do is define aging. And certainly if you ask 10 different people, what is the definition of aging? You'll probably get 10 different answers. So for the purposes of this um, talk, what I'd like to do is define aging as the following. That aging is the lifelong accumulation of damage to the body, i.e. our cells, that occur, occurs as an intrinsic side effect of our normal functions. And we know that living things can tolerate some damage, but if that's not reversed and we accumulate damage over time, that results in failure of the system, which is illness or in the case of severe failure, death. So it would be great if we were like this classic car, right? If you look on the outside, it has a rather dated look, but if you look under the hood, um, it's running perfectly. And why is that? Because someone has restored all of the wearing out parts and lovingly repaired this machine to be something that functions many, many years after its expected lifetime, lifespan. So if we believe that aging is the common element and the greatest common risk factor among all the chronic diseases of life, and if we also believe that accumulation of that damage is responsible for aging, is it possible to perform periodic maintenance on cells to repair damage along the way, like this classic car? And so as scientists, of course, we go to the model organisms of our, of our trade, and these are things like yeast and worms and flies and mice, and in some cases, genetically modified mice strains. So these are progeria mice. Progeria is the, the um, a genetic disorder that causes children to age very, very rapidly and shortens their lifespan. Um, this is a naked mole rat on the bottom here. Does anybody know? Well, I can't ask a live question, but the reason why people use naked mole rats as aging research models is because they happen to be the longest lived rodent on the planet. They live in the neighborhood of 30 years, and so they have this longevity gene. So again, something about the way that we age having to do with our genetics and, and potentially our epigenetics is really very key to understanding how maybe to modify aging. And so as a result of looking at all these wonderful models, now we have a very, very deep understanding of what causes us to age on a cellular level. And those findings that have been accumulating over the past probably 10 to 15 years are summarized in this wheel that you see here. And if those of you who have been involved in cancer research will probably recognize some of these same things that you see in cancer drivers. These are aging drivers. And they're things like telomere shortening and loss of proteostasis, cellular senescence, stem cell exhaustion, genomic instability. And you'll notice there is quite a bit of overlap in cancer drivers and aging drivers. And that's then no wonder that cancer is a disease of advanced age. So a lot of these dysregulated processes that happen in our cells are not only drivers of aging, but also harbingers of age-related chronic diseases. The problem is, despite all of the great understanding, and I mean profound advances in understanding, we still have not seen these aging um, research benefits in the human population. We actually know what drives aging, and we even know how to block those drivers in mice and flies and worms, and we can actually reverse aging in those species, but we haven't quite made it across this translational gap, which I think all of us are aware of, to the, um, to the human population. And you might ask yourself, well, why is this? And we certainly know that scientific discovery in aging, and this is true in many different disease states, is far outpacing our ability to translate, and the translational gap is increasing. So I think what we're really facing is a situation where the entrenched paradigm of going from laboratory models 
to humans really needs to change. And we've, we've known this as veterinarians for many years, but in the aging world, this is kind of new news to them that, you know, the mice don't really translate very well to humans. And so we need this bridge. And so if we take these um, drivers of aging, I just want to just very briefly go into some research that we've been doing in our lab in these two particular areas, because these are very near and dear to my heart. I, this is the area of work that I work in. And the first is cellular senescence. And the reason I'm going to share some very like shallow kind of dive into this is so that you can see how, uh, where we've progressed from looking at this in, you know, benchtop types of, of types of uh, experiments into translating this um, in a more clinically meaningful way. So cellular senescence. So cells um, undergo senescence as we age. And what's kind of interesting about cellular senescence is that when cells normally get damage to them, what happens, of course, is that they park themselves outside the cell cycle and they try to repair that damage. And if that damage isn't repaired in a specific period of time, the cell should undergo apoptosis and die for the benefit of the host. That's so it doesn't pass on genomic instability and potentially cause a cancer. But what's really interesting is that this process of apoptosis it gets, gets much less um, efficient as we age. And instead of undergoing apoptosis, they undergo this change that is essentially called senescence or cellular senescence, where they upregulate these survival genes and, and uh, anti-apoptosis genes, and they go into a, a zombie-like state. So they don't divide, but they also don't die. And then a good majority of these form this um, phenotype, the cellular type called the senescence-associated secretory phenotype. These are particularly bad actors because they don't die, they don't divide, so they don't cause a cancer, which is good, but they do upregulate um, extracellular matrix degradation enzymes and pro-inflammatory enzymes. This creates a lot of damage and a lot of low-grade inflammation. And certainly we accumulate these senescent cells as we age in every single tissue in our body. And this low grade chronic inflammation is associated with some pretty significant local and systemic consequences, including things like cancer and heart disease and other things. So there are agents now, and many of these are repurposed drugs that are being used for other reasons in medicine. For example, metformin or desatinib, um, and then even rapamycin, other things. And there's even things like flavonoids, like quercetin, um, which is kind of a curcumin type drug, or sorry, agent that's a flavonoid. And the concept is, is these, these medicines in very, very low dose actually seek out and destroy senescent cells. So on the bottom here, you see normal tissue that gets damaged, and then you have these senescent cells. And when the senescent cells are eliminated, it paves the way for regeneration. So this is a really interesting idea in terms of an anti-aging approach that clears our senescent cells that begin to accumulate as we age. The other area that I want to talk about very briefly is stem cell exhaustion and aging. And as we know, um, as we age, the stem cells, which are the repair cells of our body, begin to diminish in numbers. So we're born with a certain number of these stem cells. Um, and as we age, the stem cell reserves diminish. But in addition to being diminished, the other problem is the stem cells that we have that are left, the function is quite impaired relative to when we're younger. So not only do we have fewer cells that can act to um, direct cellular and tissue repair, the cells that we do have actually don't work very well. And this is true in smokers, by the way, which is why smokers age more rapidly as they deplete their stem cell reserves much earlier. Same with children that have had chemotherapy. They actually age quicker because their stem cell reserves are, are depleted. I have always had an interest in musculoskeletal systems, and so I was uh, recently, um, in the last five years or so, interested in how muscles age. And sure enough, muscles, skeletal muscle diminishes in numbers of stem cells as we age, and also in function, and that is actually what causes sarcopenia, or the loss of muscle mass. As we know, this loss of muscle mass is associated with frailty. Frailty is associated with morbidity, and we have frailty indices um, that we commonly use in humans. And recently, the frailty index has been modified to include dogs. So this is a proxy for um, stem cell reserve depletion that we can measure in, um, in our companion animals. And we also know, as I mentioned before, that exercise is a lifelong, um, as a lifelong habit 
improves aging and is a longevity um, intervention. And sure enough, exercise triggers stem cells and muscles. So the more we exercise and the more um, chronic that exercise is over our time frame, the more we preserve our stem cells and the more we preserve our stem cell function. And it's interesting to note that stem cells work not only by migrating to a site of injury, but also by secreting various different um, substances that are bioactive that can, trans that can actually be transported through the bloodstream in a very stable manner. And just like if the cell was present at the site of injury, these um, secretome or the, um, the particles that these cells do secrete are part and parcel of recovering those cells at a distant site. And much of this work is done by exosomes, which are these membrane-bound structures that are nanoscale particles that act as mediators in cell-to-cell -cell communication. And we've been very interested in exosomes and using these as a therapeutic platform to combat frailty and sarcopenia in um, dogs as a model for humans. And so we've actually shown that cell-free exosome suspensions can reverse age-related skeletal changes in skeletal muscle, and they can act as a cell-free mechanism to promote muscle pr uh, proliferation and actually rejuvenate muscle, at least in mice, and we believe we can do this in dogs. Okay, so that was a little journey into my particular research, but, but to take a little bit further, um, like a higher altitude view, I wanna go back to our two examples of two gentlemen, the really fit elderly gentleman and the less well-aged gentleman. And so the question then, as we think about what we've learned so far about the drivers of aging, how we can modify drivers of aging with drugs or various biologics like exosomes and other things, then we go back to this example and ask ourselves, okay, if we know all this, why hasn't this not really appeared in the human population? Where are the barriers to this? And the first bar barrier is that while we do see these two very different phenotypes at age 80, the problem is we don't know when they began to diverge. Somewhere along the lifespan between birth and age 80, these two gentlemen started to go on two very different paths. And if we could know when they began to diverge, then we potentially could intervene with some of these different um, blockers of aging at a time where we'd have the best chance of changing the trajectory of the older man in the walker to be more like this man on the right. But we have to ask ourselves, of course, when did they, they diverge, which we can't know because we don't know. All we do is see this, these two different phenotypes as they're older. Can we intervene? When should we intervene? Should this happen at the time where they begin to diverge? Could you have the same effect if it was 20 years after they began to diverge? Or you know, could you actually take two people that are very different and have accumulated, in this case, a large number of these chronic um, drivers of aging and could we reverse him now? And I think it's gonna be a lot easier to think about aging modification when at the time of a divergence rather than when we already see cellular damage that's accumulated. So how do we even study this? Um, and why haven't these discoveries been translated to widely available anti-aging therapies? I mean, we know that this is possible. We can reverse aging in mice. We're doing it in the laboratory. So where is where are these treatments? And of course, the answer is that we haven't in the aging world, and I would say the collective we, not being I, but many people have really not used the, the right model to bridge the gap. And as all of you know, because you are Morris Animal Foundation people, so you are very familiar with this, that mice are not great subjects for really many human diseases, specifically not aging, okay? Um, because they fail to mimic the heterogeneity and epigenetic um, accumulation of changes that occur of the activities of daily living. They live in laboratories, right? They eat all the same food. They're essentially genetic identical twins to one another. So because of all these different things, they just don't mimic the complexities of human aging. So this should probably be what you were expecting all along is that, okay, now we're going to show you two different dogs. And on the left, you have a Jack Russell Terrier. On the right, you have a Great Dane. Both of these dogs are nine years of age, okay? The Jack Russell Terrier is quite fit. I think this dog was the national fly ball champion um, in, I don't know, 2007 or something um, at nine. And then the dog on the right, the Great Dane, who is, ex you know, to the trained eye, you can see she has kyphosis or hunched back. You can see her muscle atrophy. And no surprise, she has some cataracts and she has heart disease. And yet both these dogs have been on the planet for the same exact amount of time. And the Great Dane, by contrast, is very geriatric versus the Jack Russell Terrier. 
for those of us who have been work, working in the world of animals, this is intuitive. We know that giant breed dogs age more quickly and they have a shorter lifespan. But when you think about it, um, the uh, Jack Russell Terrier is more akin to the gentleman that's very fit and the uh, Great Dane is more akin to the gentleman that is not so fit. Why is this? This is because um, this dog, the Great Dane, begins to age very rapidly when they become adults, okay, relative to the Jack Russell Terrier. So remember I said we have no idea when these two people begin to diverge in their pathways of aging, but now we do know when these two dogs begin to diverge in their pathway of aging, and it's when they become adults. When this Great Dane becomes adult, an adult, she begins to age in rapid motion as compared to the Jack Russell Terrier. So what this provides us now is an enormously powerful model to study interventions in aging. And in fact, if you look at all the drivers of aging we talked about already, and you look in the literature, you can find evidence that large breed dogs actually do age more rapidly on a cellular level. And to our great advantage, of course, because we would love to see dogs um, aging more in more healthy ways and expanding lifespan for these giant breed dogs. But just like um, they age alongside of us, these dogs also experience all the same drivers of aging as a result of the activities of daily living, unlike any other laboratory animal, even primates. So these dogs are, of course, living in our homes. They're exposed to our either sedentary lifestyle or active lifestyle or secondhand smoke, the pollution, all of the micro damages that we get as people, these dogs, of course, are living right alongside of us with the added benefit that we know when they begin to diverge in their aging pathways and they have all the genetic and epigenetic variability that people have to a greater extent than any other laboratory species. So dogs really are a wonderful model because they age naturally alongside of us. They get all the same diseases of aging, frailty, cancer. They even get cognitive impairment, which probably many of you are uh, familiar with. There's good um, indices of understanding cognitive decline in these dogs now. And so we're starting to realize that really the answer has been kind of walking alongside of us all this, all this time. And of course, my background being immersed in the Animal Cancer Center at Colorado State, this is something that I've like, you know, eat, slept, and breathed my whole life. When I talk about this in aging research um, communities, this is brand new news to them. They had no idea. And so, you know, all the things that we usually talk about, they get excellent health care in old age, they have a large population size, their diseases of aging develop naturally like cancers and other diseases in our pet dogs. They are genetically outbred. They have a known genome sequence. And what would take decades and decades and decades to study if you're doing an aging intervention trial in humans, you can study in five years or so in giant breed dogs. So this presents all of a sudden a very different picture in terms of being able to translate between veterinary medicine, um, human medicine, and bringing aging research and aging interventions to human populations. And certainly we believe that the missing link in the grand challenge of aging has been growing old all alongside of us. What's great also is that the, the ability to do intervention trials already exists. Of course, at Colorado State University, we've had the Cancer Center um, clinical trials program ongoing for many, many years. It's probably one of the most well-funded clinical trials programs for cancer interventions. And this, um, this framework really can be expanded and capacity increased to do aging interventions. And certainly there are a number of different comparative trials in aging research in dogs. Senolytic drugs like metformin or rapamycin are some of the most common examples. So these are things that are ongoing and are showing that, yes, we can indeed change proxy of cellular aging, for example, cardiac output in these middle-aged dogs. But intervention trials are still kind of coming online. That's probably some of the, these are probably the biggest ones that have been done. And even those, these are very few and far in between. So we now know that we can make young mice or old mice young again, right? We know we can block those drivers of aging. We've seen that in the lab. We now also know that for many measures of aging, we can change the pathway of aging for these dogs. And again, not lifetime interventions just yet, but that's coming. And using that as the bridge, we bring interventions to humans. And so um, we have been um, trying to stand up the first comparative aging research program um, at CSU in partnership with the Dog Aging Project and others. Um, and so one of the 
um, advantages of having a center for healthy aging that's directed by a veterinarian is sort of this is my natural inclination is to think how can we improve quality of life and health span in our companion animals and learn from that to bring that to the human population. And so these are all things that are part of the mission of the um, Center for Healthy Aging, thinking outside the box and creating a global culture that supports this One Health approach in aging, focusing on the discovery and translation of that discovery to promote healthy aging, not just for dogs, but also their human companions. And so the program has three core activities, um, intervention trials and companion dogs to help dogs and their humans live longer, healthier lives, global education and outreach to help medical profession professionals know about the benefits of a one medicine approach to the grand challenge of an aging world. I mean, that is something that people haven't thought about very much in the comparative world. And then we are standing up the first um, five-year longitudinal paired human canine biobank. So we're actually pairing human samples and canine samples taken on the same day, longitudinally, yearly, over five years. And that's in partnership with the Colorado Longitudinal Study and the Dog Aging Proje uh, Project. And the concept here is to look at environmental and lifestyle influences of aging, healthy versus pathologic aging, and to what extent companion dogs in the same home as a human that is aging act as sentinels for human aging, and therefore, can we predict aging pathways in humans based on how their companion dogs living in the same household are aging? So this is the center. It's located in the Health and Medical Center at Colorado State University. Um, and that is the kind of the way that we've expanded this project at Colorado State to add on to some of the other great projects that are already happening there. So I'll leave you with this quote before we take some questions. And that is that there's, there are no great people in the world. There's just great challenges. And I would say aging, aging is a great challenge of our time. And ordinary people can rise to meet them. And so I think that's all of us and all of our pet owners that can, can help in this effort. So I will end there. Um, and um, that is my email, um, which will be, I think, recorded and certainly happy to share um, by email to all of you if you want to reach me and talk more about this. But I'll stop sharing now and maybe we'll open it up for questions. So I just wanted to say thank you, Nicole, for talking to us about aging. And um, yeah, if you guys want to unmute yourself and ask questions, please do. I have one, but I'm going to save mine and um, let you guys talk for a while. Hi, this is Erin. Can I ask a question? Of course. <laughs> so um, I, I just finished grad school and worked on neurologic diseases in horses. And so we talk, I heard you talk a lot about muscle and, and, and skeletal changes, but do you guys have people working on some of the neurologic changes with aging? Yeah, so, oh, it's a great question. Thank you. Um, yeah, Erin, so we, um, we are really interested. I mean, we know that, for example, dogs get cognitive decline and they actually accumulate some of the same changes that people do in Alzheimer-like conditions, um, certainly dementia. And um, some of what we're um, doing is, is looking at different indices of cog measurements of cognitive decline in dogs and validate, validating that and working alongside other researchers that have been doing this for a while. And if we can pair some interventions, and these can be behavioral interventions, with also the Alzheimer human population, which we have very good relationships with um, through the Center for Healthy Aging, we can actually do paired human and canine clinical trials for certain types of like behavioral interventions and other things. And clearly, we also have the capacity at the center, which is really exciting for me, to do actual human subject trials, too. So we can, we can actually do drug trials, for example, um, in people at the center. Um, and that's actually what the center was developed to do, is to be a, a hub of um, you know, human um, clinical trials at CSU. And because I have such a great interest in comparative medicine, you know, pairing that with human aging trials, um, or sorry, dog aging trials um, in parallel. So thanks. Thank All you. Right, well then, oh, I will ask my question, um, Nicole. So, you know, we've done a lot of stem cells research and I was listening to you talk about um, the decline in numbers of stem cells as we age and a little bit about exercise. And I wonder if that's a bit of like, how do you, um, I guess if you're not, if you're declining, but you're exercising and doing things like weightlifting, which they tell us all to do as we get older. Um, and you mentioned, um, can you 
do you actually um, you decrease stem cell loss and maybe stimulate stem cells, or how does that work? Because I was thinking, well, if you're weightlifting but you're losing stem cells, uh, is um, you know, can you actually gain muscle? You know yeah. what I mean. Yeah, I do. I do know what you mean. Um, so, you know, exercise preserves your stem cell um, population. It doesn't necessarily create more stem cells, but it preserves the stem cells. And it also, interestingly, I talked a little bit about exosomes. And the reason I talked about that is we did a study where we took, um, we took muscle-derived stem cells from older people and muscle derived stem cells from younger people we measured the number of exosomes that the stem cells were able to produce then we took the old uh, stem cells from the old people and we put them on a bioreactor that exercised just the cells so outside the body and we measured how many exosomes that were coming off of the exercised older person muscle derived stem cells and we we're able to rescue not only the number of those exosomes just by putting the cells themselves on kind of a, a flex cell machine which is essentially kind of an ex vivo exercise machine but we could also take the exosomes that um, came from those cells put them back onto older stem cell populations and actually rejuvenate their proliferation and differentiation potential so that tells you something about exercises. There's something about it that creates an environment. The cells produce these, you know, exosomes that have cell-to-cell -cell communication. And systemically likely, we, and again, this is another experiment, but systemically can actually improve muscle mass over time. So again, the concept that you can modify how we age. We've been accepting that this, you know, sarcopenia and muscle loss over our lifespan is this inevitable you know, result of, of our advancing age. And while we can delay it with exercise, you know, we really can't reverse it. I don't think that that's true. I think we can reverse it. I think that we can reverse it using some of these types of approaches that we've talked about. And not only should, could we reverse it, but we can also intercede in that pathway to prevent that loss, um, not just with exercise, but with other therapeutics. Thanks, that, that was really interesting. Because um, again, we've done a lot of stem cell stuff. so. Also, um, from the stem cell standpoint, um, is uh, you know we we have funded stuff where we've um, taken um, more uh, stem cells that are further down, like mesenchymal stem cells, right, and drove them backwards yeah. um, toward a more pluripotent one. Has anyone looked at that with uh, aging? Um, well, yes. Um, although you know the there, that approach has a number of different risks and de-risking, you know, using um, iPSCs as a anti-aging therapeutic has been a little bit harder to navigate some of the different potential negatives or downsides, like teratoma formation or other cancer formations. So what seems to be the direction I think that this is going in is to use cell-free strategies rather than the cells themselves. I think that iPSCs are a fascinating area, and I actually think there's a huge amount uh, that they can contribute, not just from you know, studying the way that we age, but also um, potentially treating how we age. But I think that that's a little bit more of a long, longer horizon before we see that. Uh, as opposed to something like exosome suspensions or cell-free opportunities to change things. So, um, you know, there are people doing IPSC work in terms of understanding how we age and how to intervene in aging. Most of that is all in vitro and not in vivo, to my knowledge. Thank you. Anybody else? I don't want so to dominate. I have a question, if it's okay. Um, of course. So, Nicole, um, one of the big predictors in humans of health span is socioeconomic status. So is there any way to simulate that in a comparative medicine approach? Yeah, so that's so great. Thank you for asking. That's such a great question. And actually, this is one of the, po this is why this, this dual paired biobank, human uh, canine biobank is going to be so powerful. The human part of this, we're partnering with a group called the Colorado Longitudinal Study, it, which is taking a million, or it could be 10 million now, I can't remember, a million, let's just say Coloradoans over a 10 year period and sampling them. They are going to interrogate to a very deep level, everything from socioeconomic status to geographic location, to a number of different environmental influencers that we believe might be important drivers. 
And when we get that information, we are also, again, taking a subgroup of those participants and 250 pairs actually, so people and dogs living in the same household. So we'll have the in-depth um, inf information uh, about socioeconomic status and other environmental factors that we think might be part of this. Story it as part of what is available for the dog samples as well. So that's going to be very powerful. And I think we'll, you know, we'll start to see maybe some patterns. I would love to expand that to, you know, a bigger effort than 250 pairs, but that's kind of where we're starting for right now. And as you all know from the um, Golden Retriever Lifetime Study, how, what an enormous lift it is to do a longitudinal study of any kind. So we felt like this was pretty doable and maybe scalable in the future as we kind of get our legs under us. But I think it's amazingly important and I think we're going to have some hopeful, you know, hopefully have some very interesting answers. Um, I have a question. This is Rebecca. Um, Nicole um, has, has the center um, done research on treatments of acetyl carnitine and how this might affect aging and cognitive function? Yeah, um, I have no, um, we have no trials ongoing um, specifically for that, um, but I agree with you that that's another, like there are a lot of different facets to this that we could begin to dive into on a deeper level. Right now we have, well, right now being pre-COVID, um, we had uh, about seven different human clinical trials running out of the center. And then again, pairing that with some intervention trials in dogs, although again, aging um, studies, we still are trying to get funded specifically to do those types of studies in dogs that are interventions. But um, yeah, I mean, I think all of that is potentially something I would love to do in parallel with a human clinical trial and a canine trial. So I love the thought. And I think, you know, if there were opportunities to fund something like that, I think we'd be pretty prepared to move forward with that. That's awesome. Thanks. Anybody else? So I have another question, Nicole, because sure. I'm glad to have a captive audience here. Um, <laughs> you know, we've done quite a bit of genetic work with um, the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study, and I think you know, like there are certain families, right, that they ask you, do you ever have a relative live to 90, 100, 80s, right? So um, have you um, uh, thought about or looked at um, the genetics and what the genetics um, change that makes some people also live a long time yeah there's a there's a pretty big effort um uh, it's called i think it's called the centenarian cohort or something to collect um not only just uh historical information and lifestyle information but actual biologic samples from people who have lived over the age of 100 and their children um, and so again, trying to look at genetic determinants and, you know, pair that with the potential epigenetic and other types of, um, influences that occur to us as we age. And interestingly, you know, people who live a lot longer, who live over the age of hundred frequently, no surprise, have children that live over the age of hundred as well. So there is a genetic component and there have been what they call the longevity genes, um, that they've identified that are different in those folks, um, uh, than they are in the general population, or as they like to say, the wild type human, which I love that term, wild type humans. I want to be a wild type human. Um, but uh, yeah, so there's, uh, there are those, um, there's that population and there are outliers, and it would be really wonderful, for example, in Great Danes, average lifespan spans, what, eight, nine years, if we could get those types of samples from the, you know, the 12, 13, 14 year old Great Danes and, and do a similar type of cohort study. Where we look at what is different among these longer lived, longer than expected lived individuals within a specific breed. We know not to be a, a very long lived breed and understand what the differences are. And we do have, you know, the ability, and we're actually um, submitting a proposal to use machine-based learning to look at various different epigenetic um, changes within um, these two different populations, both um, large and small breed dogs, as well as longer lived, you know, of each of the types of cohorts to see if we can see differences and develop potentially, you know, intelligent um, predictors of what drives aging and what drives a successful aging pathway within you know, short breed, uh, short lived dogs like the large breed dogs. And if we could identify that and then we could either select for it or intervene that is in a way that would drive that, 
that would be a big win for all our large breed dog owners and our large breed companions. Thank you. Anybody else? Bueller, anyone? <laughs> That's, I think we're showing our age when we say that analogy, Bueller. <laughs> Does anyone know what I'm referring to? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we watched that movie this weekend. Oh, you're good. Not, you're not super aged out. You're good. <laughs> good. Glad good. to know. <laughs> this is Annie. And yes, I know the reference. And Nicole, thank you so much. I don't have a question, just a request. And as one of the older people on this staff and the youngest of several siblings, please hurry. <laughs> <laughs> I've had no shortage of people that have volunteered to be part of some of these human um, clinical trials. Yeah. So we I'm get sure. going. Absolutely. I'm, I'm right there with them. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> All right, well, if there aren't any more questions, we can let Nicole go. Um, once again, thanks um, so much to Nicole for coming um, virtually to Morris Samuel Foundation and doing this really cool lecture because we don't do a lot of aging research um, right now anyway. And it was great, great, great to hear from you. And I'm looking at the comments, Nicole, and people are like, yay. So um, thank you again so very much for coming down.